<laughs> Waylon, I'm laughing so hard here, but sorry, man. Sorry. Well, I, I have to admit I've, I've been in, in the same uh, precarious position before uh, when I first had to acclimatize to Instagram Live. So, yeah, I understand it can be quite frustrating, but uh, we've made it. <laughs> Good to finally meet you, man. Thanks for thanks for having this chat. I love these sort of things. Yes, no, thanks, thanks so much uh, for um, availing yourself. Um, I know you're busy at home with the family, um, and if it's if it's anything similar to my situation, it's uh, it's crazy in the evenings. Yeah, I mean, you know what it's like. You get that that hell hour, as we like to call it, between <laughs> about six and half past seven, but. Uh, yes. Giselle's pretty good at taking care of all that. But my kids are a little older now, so it's got better. Yes. But, uh, we've been doing some sport and stuff, so they get uh, pretty hungry and needy, and they want the food now. Yes, yeah. Well, you're not, you're not painting a very uh, pretty picture for me. My son's um, almost three, so I, I guess it only gets more crazy as the years go on. Yeah, no. It's <laughs> the biggest blessings we could have, hey, but uh, they give yes. us a lot of joy. I think you need some of those tough times to enjoy the good times, eh? Absolutely. Although I'm, I don't think I'm ready for the second one, so um, <laughs> we, we've got a we've got a, a pet now to intercede. So I think I've bought myself some time. Sweet, sorted, <laughs> man. <laughs> so, so probably probably a good place to start. Obviously, for our viewers that are joining in, um, maybe a brief history of of where you were born and raised. And sort of your journey to where you are now. I'm a born and raised uh, Westville boy. Uh, of course, uh, you're teaching there now, and it's a place yes. that's really close to my heart. Um, just down the road from uh, Westville Boys High School, probably uh, a 10 or 12 minute walk. That's okay. uh, That was my journey every day when I was in high school. I went to primary school at Bria West, which is the other side of Westville, Wayland. Um, yes. Yeah, and played all my tennis at Westville Tennis Club. You know, between Westville Boys High, Westville Tennis Club, and where it used to be called Health and Racket in the early days. I don't know if you remember the, the chain yes. of gyms before they became Virgin and were bought out by, by yes. the Virgin Group. We're all in such a, a nice close proximity. And yeah. I had, the, you know, the best of both worlds training there and going to school there. Um, and, of course, many great years at Westville Boys High. Trevor Hall used to play tennis with me. Of course, Trevor was my accounting teacher back in the day there. Uh, yeah, was I believe he was a very talented uh, tennis player. He was. He had the old continental grip, the Trev. Very <laughs> flat on both sides. Uh, always had to behave when you were on the court with Trev. I always felt like he was so well-mannered. And uh, <laughs> you know, the French side of my personality always used to fire every now and then. And and I used to get pretty excitable uh, on the tennis yes. court. But I always thought when Trevor was around, I had to like rein that in a bit. <laughs> but, um, I mean, he could tell you a lot of stories about me when I was a youngster. Throwing my racket, I was um, <clears throat> the baby of four. So the discipline, when I came along, wasn't as as much as what my older siblings will tell you. So, yes. yeah, and then, you know, as I say, born and raised in the Westville. My brother went there, and my two sisters were, were local as well at the, the high school. <clears throat> and then when I matriculated in 89, Waylon, um, I had an interesting decision to make. Um whether I was going to go to the army first or whether I was going to try and go to American college. And actually that changed in 1990. It became the first of the one year intake military service used to be two years. And I decided, okay. let me get this over and done with. And I was one of yes. the few guys that actually went that route. A lot of the guys, a lot of my peers went straight to the States to college guys like Ellis Ferreira, Kevin Elliott, a lot of those mm. Durban guys, Wayne Ferreira. Yes. Um, and, you know, looking back in hindsight, I wish I, wish I hadn't uh, done mm. that military service because it really was a step back in my tennis career. I was going quite nicely in the juniors. I wasn't a prolific junior until yeah. maybe second year under 16. Um, and it was only my last two and a half years where I started to play some decent tennis. And then that's yeah. when the decision making came. You know, was I going to go to college? Because I had a uh, an offer from two colleges in America to go and play tennis there. Or was I eventually going to go pro? And then right around that last couple of months uh, of 1990 in, in military service, the South African Tennis Federation, they expanded their sponsorship from four guys to mm -hmm. eight guys. 
And suddenly, I'd always been missing out. Suddenly, I became part of that, uh, what they call the elite squad. And then a few of us started to travel overseas. They paid for everything. And so I turned down um, those, the opportunity to go to college in America then. And, um, and then I've just been playing for 13 years thereafter from basically yeah. I turned pro was about 1992. And I played to the end of 2005. So that was my playing career. Yes. And thereafter, I coached for a year, which was a lot of fun. And then I got yeah. a chance meeting with a, somebody who became a good friend of mine. I got into the commentary business, and I've been doing it for the last 13 years, following the, the best players in the world around, living my dream, man. I, I was going to say, uh, what is the worst part of your job? But I suppose not, not uh, much comes to mind in terms of uh, all your experiences and what you get to partake in, especially watching um, a lot of class tennis players at the moment. It's just been such a golden generation for our sport, Well, And I, mm. I don't know how much you follow tennis, but, you know, when Pete Sampras broke the record for the most number of majors, 14, mm. we yes. thought, you know, that's going to be a record that stands for a long time. <laughs> Um, yeah. And then, of course, in the next generation, we've got three guys who have not only passed 14, but they've passed it and left it in the dust. And, yes. you know, in fact, they've really taken out a whole generation of players and their ability to win majors. Guys like Milos Raonic or Grigor Dimitrov, these guys haven't been able mm -hmm. to win majors because those guys mm -hmm. ahead of them haven't moved on. They've just continued playing and getting better and staying around and evolving. And I think that's been the most amazing thing about watching Federer, Nadal, Djokovic, mm. and to a slightly lesser extent, Andy Murray, is, mm. is uh, I'm getting to interact and live and breathe something that I'm so passionate about on a daily basis. Um, of course, the hardest part probably is the travel, being away from the family. Um, mm. but I'll do about 24 weeks a year, but I always remind people who tend to side with my wife in this discussion that I have 28 weeks holiday. So when I'm <laughs> not on the tour, I'm back home, you know, enjoying my family time. And, you know, there's not many guys out there that have 28 weeks of holiday. And it's, it's obviously, you, you're so correct, obviously the domination of the current crop, I mean, the, uh, those top three tennis players, uh, to have two deca decades of domination. And, mm -hmm. and I've, I've always had a, well, I've always loved sport growing up. Um, obviously, rugby is what I pursued after school, but I mean, I have a love for cricket and, and uh, football and athletics and mm. a whole host of sports. And I, I think um, watching tennis was always um, a wonderful sport to engage with. Although, being a Roger Federer fan, um, I think he just encompasses so much of what I believe a good sporting role model should be. Uh, but I must admit, trying to watch him play uh, in, in tennis semifinals or finals is the most nerve-wracking. <laughs> yeah, I, look, I think I stopped watching him for a few years because I thought I maybe jinxed him. And, and <laughs> tennis, tennis for me is just the hardest. You, it kind of draws you in. It feels like you're literally your hands are sweaty for the yeah. person. Um, so I've always had a massive respect for the sport because I think just from a, a mental side, the amount of concentration you need um, to dig yourself out of momentum shifts, it must, it's quite a remarkable sport. And that's why I, I can't understand these guys that have dominated for so long are still healthy and fit and, and still love what they're doing because it must be a lot of stress um, to put your body through and especially... Um, your emotions um, in big part as well. Yeah, and having played sport at the highest level, you know all about that. And I think what makes the sport so tough is, as you say, it encompasses so many things. The skill level of it is so high. You know, I always mm. remind people that in tennis, you have to learn to hit the ball on three sides of your body. It's not like golf where mm. everything happens on one side. Yeah. It's left, right, and above your head. Um mm. You've got to marry that with incredible physical ability. These days, that's almost more important than being able to hit the ball mm. uh, because of the way that the rackets and the strings have evolved. Players hit the yes. ball with so much pace and spin these days. And if you're not an athlete, you can't keep up with these guys. 
mm. and then you've got to marry that as well with all the international travel so you don't get the luxury of say you know the nba guys who play half their matches in their own backyard or mm. the us golfers on the us tour who are pretty much playing everything in america for you know mm. one event maybe when they come over for the british open and mm. similarly for the european golfers it's nice and condensed whereas these tennis guys have got to travel all over the world play at different altitudes and get used to so many variables mm. and then you know when you're trying to break through well and you've got the financial cost in order mm. to to become a good pro you have to travel and it costs a lot so if you don't come from one of the big four federations that host the grand slams that being you know australia france the uk or the us mm. the tennis can become a, a pretty expensive sport when you're trying to break through and a lot of guys aren't able to sustain themselves long enough to give mm. themselves that chance to to eventually break through because they they simply run out of funds and mm. as you know athletically in the early stages of your career you're not quite there you know we're mm. seeing an average age of a player these days in the top 100 at 27 years 6 months sure. and that's because <laughs> the game has become so physical and these guys like Djokovic Murray Nadal Federer you know they they've just taken it to vertigo inducing heights yes and do you do you see a demise anytime soon obviously roger being uh, the older of the the top 3 uh, not to diminish the other guys on the periphery uh, but do you see see roger calling it quits anytime soon and dal um maybe ushering in the new uh, batch of players Um certainly not in Nadal and Djokovic. Mm. I think they're going to be around for a long time and I think Novak mm. really looks after his body well. Rafa yes. I'm a little concerned with because he's had so many injuries well and his knees have been dodgy yeah. for a long time. Yes. Um and he often takes these big breaks in the season where he just has to let the the knees recuperate. Mm. So but I mean if you talk about a guy who you'd want to play for your life I think yes. he'd be <laughs> top of the list maybe one of the toughest competitors and certainly uh, in all of sport i would say one of the toughest asks is to beat nadal on a clay court i mean his record is insane and when you think how how small the margins are in tennis a break a serve here or break a serve there can mean that you lose a match to have his kind of record on clay it's just it's mind boggling so i don't yeah. see those two going away anytime soon roch You know what the amazing thing about Roger is he loves the game and he doesn't mind the mm. traveling. Obviously he travels first class everywhere and he mm. absolutely loves it. And his wife Mirka who used to play has said to him you play as long as you want. But when you mm. decide to hang it up that's it there's no going back. So in in many respects this covid year for him has been perfect timing because he was having knee surgery early on and yeah. so great way for him to shut down the season with everybody else so no one's going to gain any ground on him. So you as a Federer fan you can be pretty pleased about that. I think all Federer fans be pretty pleased about that. Um yeah. but he's got he's also got the top of game that is so efficient. So mm. he doesn't have the sort of strain on his body that say an Adele has. So that's yes. why he's been able to have this uh, longevity. But really after the the Wimbledon final last year, I think that was a match that really hurt him mentally. Big time yeah. having those match points on serve. and then you know losing to a guy who's he really been a thorn in the side is is Djokovic mm. and i think it was like a double whammy there's nothing worse than our sport well and then having match points and losing it really mm. does haunt you and especially in the finals of a major mm. and when that major is wimbledon mm. you know that hurts well it's interesting you touched on obviously the longevity and covid coming at a opportune time for a lot of sportsmen um i i spoke to chad um a couple of weeks ago and obviously he had some injuries to heal through so he had a bit of time now thankfully with the covid pandemic to heal up whether or not olympics happens or not next year i think time mm. will tell um but i think in, in many aspects roger kind of mimics tom brady um for that longevity um i mean you were speaking that name immediately popped up for me because I suppose everyone keeps asking how long are these guys going to keep playing and I, I think probably their wives have said the same thing to them when you finally decide to stop that set there's no going back hey, so hang on <laughs> hang on Tom Brady only has to play for 18 weeks a year hey so 
Gisela Bunchen has got nothing to complain about. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's gone to warmer climate now, so let, yes. let, let's hope it protects his body for a little, a little while longer. Mm. Um, but also, like tennis is such a battle of attrition, and yeah. I, I think about as you said, guys you want to die for that would die for you on the court. Mm. Um, I often think back when I started watching tennis and started enjoying it during that era of Pete Sampras and Agassi. Mm -hmm. um, another guy that comes to, to mind is Michael Chang. Yeah. Although he doesn't have um, as many accolades um, as tennis players gone before him or after, I just used to love his tenacity to stay in mm -hmm. points. I just, I've yeah. never seen an engine on someone like that in my entire life. And I mean, even today it resonates with me. I always wonder um, where that guy is in the world and what he did for for that battle-hardened tennis player that just doesn't give up. Mm. A, a couple of interesting things there. He had an older brother who was a decent tennis player. So I'm sure you've heard plenty of sporting stories about guys who've had older brothers that used to, you know, basically kick their butts when they were younger. And it actually toughens them up. So he had an older brother, yes. Carl. He used okay. to do that for a long time. I always remember A.B. de Villiers telling stories about his older brothers. You know, putting him into bed was five minutes to go before it got dark. And his goal was to keep them out there as long as he could. So, <laughs> so he could bet as long as he could and make life uncomfortable for him. That, that story really resonated uh, with me when I read his book. And exactly the same for Michael Chang. Older brother made him so tough early on in his career. And then obviously that translated so well. But I also think one of the greatest um, compliments you can play, pay any sportsman is the fact that they have maximized their career. And he certainly was incredible in doing that. Never had the firepower, was never going to get three points with a serve because that was pretty mm. average. And he was playing with the likes of, you know, the Agassiz uh, mm. and Sampras's of the world. I mean, America had an incredible talent pool back then. Jim Curry, I'm sure you must have remembered him yes, as well. Yes, yes. There were so many good guys. Um, and for him to have the kind of career that he did, he won a couple of, Masters 1000 events, which is the level just below our, our majors. And yeah. I see him around. Uh, he was coaching Kane Shikori for a while. So I used to see him around. Still a very reserved, quite a religious guy is, mm -hmm. is Michael Chang. His Christianity was uh, first and foremost in his life. And uh, he was always very understated away from the court. And to this day, he's very much involved in the church uh, back mm -hmm. in California where he lives now. So that's what's become of him, eh? Well, I'm sure he's he's resting, or I wouldn't I wouldn't picture him resting. I'm sure he's keeping himself busy somehow. Yeah. Um, I suppose the hardest thing is you never quite get rid of that competitiveness. I think yep. that kind of stays with you for the rest of your life. So I'm sure he's he's challenging someone somewhere to something. Yeah. Um, but obviously a great servant for the game of tennis. Obviously, I have many um, remarkable memories of him growing up. Uh, mm. And I think obviously all the flagship tennis players of the time, but but for me, yeah. he kind of stood out, and and I always enjoyed watching him play tennis. Yeah, no, too um, true. And, and you know, Wayne, actually, you know, you mentioned Chad there, and I I watched your Instagram live with him, and and it's just reminded me of it now, and I, and I wanted to have this discussion with you, yeah. and I was fascinated to hear about Chad when he looks back at his career now. You know, he's older, he's wiser, and it, geez, it just resonated with me, and I'm sure it's the same for you. Yes. The things that you would have done differently. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, when he was discussing that, I thought that, for me, that's one of the first things I ask any pro athlete that I meet. doesn't matter what sport. Waylon, if you could mm -hmm. do a couple of things differently in your rugby career, what would they be? Mm -hmm. And that would be a laundry list as long as... <laughs> that might be a bio biography worth of things, yeah. Um, yeah. which is, yeah, it's, a, it's obviously a great question. And I think a lot of sportsmen grapple with that, especially yeah. after their career when they've got time to have a deeper introspection in terms of the highs and, and lows and all the things that went, went with it. Yeah. Um, but I think for me personally, um, if I could go back in time to my to my younger self, um, I think I would have I would have been more present in terms of ticking the boxes in the week. Um, I think you, as as a young sportsman, you can get drawn into looking too far ahead, 
um, especially when things are going well. Um, whereas you should be getting excited for the day and getting excited for the training mm -hmm. and not worrying so much about what actually comes on the weekend. And obviously mm -hmm. you learn to appreciate the moments more in your career. And it's obviously not as fleeting when you look back on it because you're yeah. like, oh, I, I, I could have just appreciated this, could have just appreciated um, doing the extras or maybe doing extra sets of this or maybe doing more research in terms of recovery or maybe doing something different to out-of-the-box thinking. I mean, I think we are very fortunate in this day and age. Um, there's a lot of plethora of information out there to help sportsmen. Um, so if you if you really want to be a top flight sportsman, I think the devil's in the detail. So for me, the details would have been more priority. Not that they weren't when I was playing, uh, but if you look at the guys like Tom Brady, and I've, I've, obviously he's one, also one of the role models I look up to, mm -hmm. um, the best players, and I interviewed Odua, who also had a long career at the Sharks, Odua and Ngana, mm -hmm. and it, it's all about the detailed stuff. If you're mm -hmm. doing physio, uh, your recovery, your ice baths, your nutrition, um, coming in half an hour early to, to watch a video tape, uh, analysis, working closely with your coaches, asking questions, engaging. Um, I think as, as a young person, you, you kind of, you're just reliant on your, on your talents. Mm -hmm. uh, it only gets you so far. And I think the best players evolve as the sport evolves. And you can kind of grow with the sport in terms of your personal development. So for me, I'd probably say, uh, I'd probably look closer to the to the detail, sort of like a Bill Belichick, uh, the Patriots organization, where they where they don't leave any details to spare in terms of their preparation. Yeah, and and it's amazing because you see that uh, certainly in my sport, I can I can speak for tennis and. You know, that's exactly the same with the very top guys at the sport. Of course, they have the financial mm -hmm. um, muscle to invest heavily in themselves. But it's one of the biggest regrets I have in my tennis career is not investing in myself when I was starting mm -hmm. to make some decent money. You know, you, you struggle for mm -hmm. a while. And the first time you get the chance to make some money and the bank account looks uh, reasonable, you just want to hang mm -hmm. on to it. And I wish I had invested in a traveling coach and maybe even a physio mm -hmm. early on in my career. Because when yes. I did do it later on, um, it was the best thing ever. And then that investment pays even more dividends because you start to play better. You win more matches. You win more prize money. Mm -hmm. Become a better player, more consistent. So yeah, that's, that was one of my biggest regrets. And not reading when I was younger. I was terrible at school. I think I read one book my entire schooling career. <laughs> um, and it was only yeah. when I got a, a knee injury. I was going really well in, in 1992 out of fantastic a uh, year there, my first full year as a pro, Waylon. And then halfway yeah. through 93, I had a problem with my knees. Yeah. Um, I'm not the biggest guy at the best of times. I think uh, dripping wet out of the shower, I'm about 68 kilos. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I used to train so much. In fact, I used to overtrain. That was one of my problems. And, you know, my yeah. muscles and joints weren't strong enough to, to handle that workload. And then I got injured. And it was only when I got injured that I had this time to start reading. Um, mm. And probably one of the most influential books I ever read at the time was Awaken the Giant Within by mm. Tony Robbins. And it gave me an incredible insight as to how the mind works and that how visualization and having mantras and saying mm. things on a daily basis can create strong neural pathways. And that, you know, what you think is what you become. Mm. And I started reading a lot after that. And I felt that was, it was so enlightening for me. And one mm -hmm. thing I try and encourage the young kids that I interact with is read. You're getting knowledge from people. Some of these mm -hmm. people have, have studied a specific, um, you know, area of sport for 10, 20, 30 years. And they're condensing it all in a book for you that you can read in two or three days or a week. And you're gaining mm -hmm. so much knowledge. Yes, you're not experiencing what they have experienced. But that knowledge, you can, you know, you can turn into something so positive. Um, mm -hmm. And I think... As, a, as an adult, that's been one of my favorite journeys um, is reading these great books. And, and it's, it's something I wanted to recommend to people who are listening in here. A couple of the books, mm. one of the best books I've read of late 
Now, I don't come from a team environment, so mm. I've always been really interested as to what the dynamic is like in a team environment. And I read this mm. book by Sam Walker called The Captain Class. Uh, mm -hmm. And Sam is a writer for, I think it was the Wall Street Journal. And he was mm -hmm. going to start a regular column um, about some of the best teams. And once he started digging into the best teams, he, he couldn't believe how much stuff there was to digest. Mm -hmm. And what's supposed to, what was supposed to be a weekly column ended up in being a 10-year research into what made yeah. these great dynasties. And yeah. you know, he studied teams from all over the world, and it had to be international teams. Um, anyway, and he, he basically breaks it down into his top, I think it was a top 16 list of the greatest sporting dynasties and mm. um, what made those dynasties so great. And it was such a fascinating, such a fascinating read. And what he found was it wasn't the coach, it wasn't the money, it wasn't how much history the organization had, but the only commonality all the great dynasties in sport had was the captain. The captain mm. always bookended their period of dominance. Mm. Um, so the first half of the book, he talks about all the different criteria that he looks at, and then he hones in on the captain. And then the, the last half of the book, the, the last third of the book, he, he says, what are the characteristics of these captains? And I mm. found it you know, so, so interesting. In fact, the only team that ends up on the list twice is a team in your sport. Have a guess what it is. Oh my goodness. <laughs> no idea. Who the, is All Blacks. the All Blacks. Oh, okay, the All Blacks. Yes. The team that so that's twice. the obvious one, yeah. Yeah, on, on that list. Um, and it was, you know, anybody, if anybody's listening on here and they want a, a great book on team leadership about the dynamics within teams, I can highly recommend it. The Captain Class by Sam Walker. It's yeah. it's brilliant, man. absolutely brilliant. And the other one I enjoyed not so long ago was uh, Endure by Alex Hutchinson. He's a sports scientist in the UK. And he basically, he talks about the elasticity of human endurance, Waylon, and yeah. how when you actually put your mind to something, what you think is your limit is nowhere near your limit. Mm. And then he dives into why is that the case? You know, is it because of diet? Is it because you get affected by the heat that you, mm. your body stops working as hard because it's preserving energy? And he goes through all these different criteria. Um, mm. But everything comes back to one thing, and mm. it's your mind. And how your mind can control everything in your body. And then he goes into a lot of depth about um, how powerful the mind is. They do these crazy experiments where they, you know, they, they inject these athletes with things that just, um, it numbs the body and the mind just does not let them stop. They just keep going and going and going and going. Incredible experiences. Um, the power of positive thoughts. These guys are, are cycling mm. on bikes and uh, subliminally they're watching a video as they cycle as hard as they can go for 11 minutes. And mm. subliminally there's an unhappy face that goes on the screen that they can't even see. Yeah. Um, then they have a happy face that goes on the screen that they can't see. Just with the happy face that happens subliminally, there's something yeah. like 18% better. Wow. <laughs> Just from the mind, you know, the positivity. Uh, what an yes. interesting book that was, Endure by Alex Hutchins. And uh, uh, I've really got into reading. It's, and it's so ironic that at school, uh, I think I, I read one book, Jonathan Livingston Seagull. I remember to this day. It was the only book report I did in my whole life, <laughs> Waylon. <laughs> Uh, and here you are obviously sharing your knowledge now. Might as well have a book club. Uh, yeah. I, I see a lot of people are, are sending messages. Uh, what is the name of that book again? So, yeah, okay. I obviously find it fascinating. I mean, uh, when I started my career, um, it, it was a foreign concept in terms of focusing on your mental strength and understanding the power of what's capable, capable inside you. And obviously, when you look back again, I know you asked me that question, when you look back mm -hmm. again, you wish you had spent more time with the pioneers at that time, who did a lot more research to understand. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there, there's many ways to improve yourself, your game, your sport. Uh, but obviously, it, it always starts with your, with your mind.
if you think yeah. about it in, in, yeah. in essence. Yeah. Um, and then obviously um, what you were saying about the, um, the reading, um, our first team rugby coach, he's not as immersed into American culture the way I am. So okay. I'm, a, I'm a big American sports fan. I watch the NBA, NBA and I'll get up to watch the NFL games early uh, mm-hmm. when it's in season. So, I mean, I've been doing that for many years and I've, I've obviously loved it. But um, now you're va- available with all these um, video resources where you can actually follow these teams and get a chance to experience a little bit of their culture and the way they operate. Mm. And I mean, before lockdown, he hadn't immersed himself, or not as much as I have, into into the culture of, of mm-hmm. professionalism and how these top organizations operate. And he mm-hmm. says, once he watched the first one, he watched the second one and he was hooked. And I mean, as a rugby player, um, it just shows you the, the value. You can You can watch any sporting team or environment mm-hmm. or organization and you can learn from them mm-hmm. and obviously add it to your repertoire of skills or whatever you're trying to create in terms of your coaching environment and in terms of what you your output what you're trying uh, these kids to achieve so i mean i think covid's been in good good in that sense if you mm-hmm. used your time wisely um, I think a lot of people have cracked open Pandora's box, so to speak. Yeah. And they've learned a lot about themselves and they realize the perspective of actually going out there and seeing how other people go about their business. There's so much to learn. And, and do you ever stop learning? <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> certainly um, in my experience, I'm, I'm 49 now and it's, you learn so much all the time. There's so many knowledgeable people out there. I think, you know, I just use something, Twitter, for example. Twitter's a great tool for me as as a journalist, right? Because if I'm not at an event, I can pick up a lot of information. But these guys that are out there, look, I'm, I'm immersed in tennis, and I know tennis well. Yeah. There's guys out yeah. there that don't even travel to events that seem to know more about what's going on in the sport than what I do. And I think it's amazing, you know? I think my finger's on the pulse, but there, there's people out there, and that's what's that's what I'm enjoying about this this day and age that we live in. But I wanted to get back to you as well and, and get your thoughts yeah. on something I get asked a lot as well is is developing young talent. Yeah. You know, I think working with elite athletes, different skill sets are required. For me, the toughest thing to do is is develop talent. You know, mm-hmm. certainly in my sport from the age of 8 to 18 is where mm-hmm. proper coaching takes place. There is so mm-hmm. many different elements that you have to try and knit together. I always feel when you're working with elite athletes, it's mainly fine-tuning. Yes. Now, you're, you're, at, you're at Whistle Boys High. If you give advice to parents or coaches about important things that they have to get across and instill in youngsters in order to be successful. Mm-hmm. What are those traits? What are the day to day things you have to do? I think um, I was privileged enough to, to work under David Campisi, who was at the Sharks when we um, had that successful run in 2007. And he was a big advocate coming from Australia about basics. And we had done a lot of coaching clinics at the Sharks um, to develop younger kids at different various times in the year. And one thing that I I know infuriated him uh, was the lack of of skills at a young age. Um, And at the time, I didn't quite understand it. I was a a professional sportsman. I was trying to understand it from his point, uh, point of view. But I only really grasped the concept uh, in 2015 when I came back to the Sharks. And um, I spent some time helping Wrestle Boys High, uh, a lot of their junior teams coaching, especially under 14s, under 15s. Mm-hmm. And for me, I, I couldn't believe um, that some of the, of the boys couldn't catch and pass. Nat- naturally gifted sportsmen, no doubt. Um, but for me, I was kind of flabbergasted that at 14, what had transpired at primary school 
that this hadn't because I think as a, as a professional person, you, you kind of expecting a lot from, from the students. So you're thinking at 14, 15, um, you can implement what you're trying to teach them and they can execute. Yeah. Um, but I think it was, it was a good growth moment for myself, mm. understanding that basic skills, especially in, in South Africa for me, um, was lacking to in a massive extent. I mean, I, I spent the better part uh, just going back to, to basic drills. Yeah. So, so for me, I think I'm, I'm still an advocate today about, especially for juniors. I mean, you have a lot of talented boys. You always have a lot of talented kids. But what sets, you, what sets um, exceptional kids apart from the good kids is that attention to detail and that l learning to love the basics. Yes. And again, I go back to a guy like Audra, who would do basic stuff that you would do at high school after practices, but he would put in that work after practice to hone his skills. Mm -hmm. Even if it was just a normal, I'm going to do 50 passes with my mates on the line. I mean, you, you don't get more basic than that. Yeah. Um, so for me, at, at a junior level, you obviously you want the kids to prioritize having fun. They have to have a passion for what they're doing. Yeah. So you don't want to, to be too rigid in terms of the experience because they are learning and growing within the sport. Mm. So you, you, the most important thing is for them to have fun, mm. but just the, the basics. Uh, and I think um, that's something that's dearly lacking, I think, in South African sports. And I think it's 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 I think it's obviously an upward trend now, and I think as sports coaches we put more, and obviously the hiring of of sport coaches at schools is obviously more competitive. You're bringing in professional guys. I'm sure yeah. when you were at school, you probably had your maths teacher teaching you tennis. I know I had Doc Cowie uh, teaching me cricket and Lovely. rugby, and I know football was his passion, but. Yeah, I mean, um, not to take away uh, from him, but obviously the game changed when I came back to Westford and you, you get exceptional coaches to come in to develop these kids. Yeah, uh, And obviously they understand the need for that. When a boy's in grade eight, by the time they get to matric, you want them to be executing at a high level. And when yeah. I was at high school, that expectation was, was never that high. But for these boys... Um, it, it's almost become very professional, especially at the competitive boys' schools around the country. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can relate. Um, mm. When you talk about basics, I see, I think a, a lot of lower-ranked players, a lot of juniors would be almost a little disappointed when they see the top tennis players play because you won't believe how how many basic drills they will do before <laughs> they go onto the the court and player set against somebody else who's at a tournament practicing. Mm. I mean, I just think of somebody like Nadal. The most basic stuff is just done over and over again. Same with mm. somebody like Stan. But every one of them does mm. the basics well. And they understand that it's without that foundation, they can't do all the fancy stuff and all the frills. Mm -hmm. um, and I could not agree more with you. I think it's also important as well for coaches to allow – kids when they're young to experiment mm -hmm. to to throw in a bit of flair i think sometimes coaches can be too hell-bent on the perfect technique kids not having a bit of fun and i think it's it's always important to allow kids to to have a bit of flair and try and showcase some sort of skill set that that is outside of the norm because i think that's how you grow mm -hmm. as a as a young kid um and for me certainly in tennis that's the case. Repetition is the mother of skill. Do things mm -hmm. over and over again with the right amounts of intensity. Don't mm -hmm. do it for too long with the kids. That's the other thing I found. Do it for five minutes or so. Give them a break. Change it up. Maybe come back to it. Um, I'm fascinated by what happens certainly in my sport. And I'm sure it's the same in yours between 8 and 18 when uh, you mm -hmm. can have a coach at a, at a school, uh, at a tennis club, at an academy that can really make you love your sport, grow the passion for it, actually turn you away from it. And um, certainly in primary school, I had a, had a teacher that was a, by the name of Kevin Thwaites, who was just the most awesome human being. He didn't say too much. He wasn't trying too technical. And you knew that when he praised you, you had done yeah. something well. It wasn't ever <laughs> too forthcoming. 
And you yes. always wanted him to say, oh, great ball there, great ball, good backhand. He didn't say much. Um, and he's a guy that I always think about, certainly in my early days. And then similarly for me as a coach, who was a guy who played on the tour, who coached me for many years here in, in Durban, John Ewell. He had a huge yeah. impact on my life. Again, one of those guys who didn't say too much, but uh, just said enough to keep you encouraged. Very rarely said anything negative. And if, if he was going to say something negative, he did it in such an intelligent manner that you never felt that he was condescending. He was just trying yeah. to make you better, whether it was your personality, your mindset, or your game. And I yeah. think any coach with those kind of traits are, are just fantastic. Eh? Yeah. Um, I think, obviously, another thing, just to uh, maybe a, go a little bit off-center, um, my biggest frustration is, obviously, back when I was in, in high school, that expectation to achieve post-high school mm -hmm. was never such a, a massive thing. It, it's not like I thought I was going to be a professional sportsman. But I feel the kids of, of this this day and age... Um, they struggle to manage expectation. Um, so I, I'd love to get your, your thoughts on that because for me, um, not, not making it or not being a professional should not diminish your love for playing the game after school. And I think we, we lose a lot of kids uh, to sport because maybe they haven't met their goals or they haven't achieved enough, so they decide to quit the sport indefinitely. And I think that's what I'm trying to encourage the kids as well, is to manage the expectations. You do the sport because you love it. It's obviously got a shelf life. Uh, maybe not so much for Roger Federer and Tom Brady, who seem to go on and on and on. Mm. Um, but I just find it so hard. I think it's uh, most kids expect this. They deserve this. They will get this. If they don't get it, the world is, has wronged them. And what do they do after? Uh, yeah. Maybe a good question to, to ask yourself, obviously, the generational uh, changes that have happened, especially from my time to, to how I see the kids now. Um, maybe you can shed some light on that. I think one of the things that sportsmen don't think about is life after sport or, or kids, um, certainly in the professionals. A lot of people come to the end and it's like, what next? I think it's so important, you know, my son, he, he's enjoying his tennis. He wants to go pro one day, but I always yeah. remind him, you can probably play till you're 35 and then you have to think about other things that you might want to do. So I've yeah. planted that seed early. Um, when you talk about kids at high school enjoying sport, I think it's the most important thing that they understand what the expectations are. And I think if you're a good coach, when, yeah. when a player's getting – let's say close to the end of their matric year that, that you have an honest discussion with them. Look, mm. you're never going to be good enough to make Natal. You're never going to be good enough to make South Africa. Make sure that you have got a plan B. But I think you have to say it in a, in a very careful way as well, because I tell you what, well, and I've seen tennis players and I've played with guys who at 18, 19, I thought had no chance of having a decent professional career. I yeah. traveled with Pat, Pat Rafter, who went on to be world number one, won two US yes. Open. A guy called Yevgeny Kafelnikov. Yes. Same story, yeah. two majors, Yevgeny. And I traveled with those guys for about three months, and I could not believe how bad they were. I could not believe how bad they were at 18, <laughs> 17, 18. Um, and the other guy I traveled with, he was a little bit younger than me, was Tim Henman. Now I was blown away by how good Tim was as a yeah. youngster. Look, this guy is a sure thing to win majors. He's going to be a, a great tennis player. And of course, out of the three guys, Henman is the only one who never won a major and never got to world number one. Scary. The other two, <laughs> in fact, Kafalikov, I remember practicing with him almost for two weeks straight and every day. And eventually I said to his coach, you know, how do you guys afford to, to keep going and who sponsors Yevgeny? And he just said three words to me. He went, IMG, Robbie, they put the money. And I just thought, sure. these guys, obviously, remember IMG, the, the big um, yes. management company, and I just thought, these guys are wasting their money. But of course, you know, a couple of years later, I ate my words when the guy's winning the French Open and winning singles and doubles at the French <laughs> in the same year. So, yes, you've got to be careful, I think, when you tell kids about the expectations. But yes. it's so important to realize and plan for life 
after mm -hmm. sport, whether it's at high school or, or whether it's post career. And yeah, I try and yes. I try and give my my youngsters um, ideas of things that might challenge them. But yeah. it's not easy, you know, myself included. I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, and, and I kind of yeah. fell into commentating as a byproduct of um, losing my first coaching job after six months when the player decided he didn't want to work with me anymore. And then yeah. I realized how fickle the coaching roundabout yeah. could be. Um, yes. And, you know, I fell into commentary with a very fluke meeting of, of an old friend of mine who was doing commentary. He said, yeah. would I be interested in it? I went for a couple of trial mat matches during uh, the 2006 season. And then at the end of the year, the guys offered me a job and I've been commentating ever since and my timing could not have been better. And sometimes it's a, you know, you need a bit of luck in life, eh, Waylon. Timing is everything. You know, so I, if I decide to play six more months, I don't meet the guy who offered me the job. Maybe I'm not doing tennis commentary now, who knows? Um, yeah. so, and yeah. sometimes it, it can be a sobering thought when you try and, and think of the what ifs yeah. where you could be if if something didn't pan out in just the correct way where yeah. your life or, or where the road could have taken you I suppose no, not too true and like I said to you at the start of our chat I feel so blessed to do what I do to watch this generation of players you know it's, it's such a diverse bunch of guys we've got top guys in, in Asia, what Kei Nishikori is doing in, in Japanese mm -hmm. and Asian tennis has just been amazing what, what's happening in Europe with, you know, the top three guys. Um, we just need a, someone from America now to, to come to the party to make it even more exciting because that is such yeah. a big market. But uh, uh, I've been so lucky to do what I do. So, you know, long may it continue. Hopefully I'll keep doing a decent job and they'll keep me on, man. I don't swear <laughs> on air or, don't say anything <laughs> stupid, man. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you'll continue to stay as professional as ever. So I don't doubt that for a second. Um, I think we've probably got about 10 minutes. So maybe a good way to finish off is um, obviously you've had, I suppose, two careers. If you look at your, your broadcasting career and obviously your tennis career, um, any positive, influential mentors that kind of guided you throughout your career and then maybe in your broadcasting career and then probably just finally any advice or anything you want to share especially with our young sportsmen that might be viewing in before we close up sure um i think certainly in tennis you know i was surrounded by a good bunch of guys i think that was one of the reasons that uh, we had a little bit of success guys like Kevin Elliott, and there was a, mm. there was Clinton Marsh, there was Neville Godwin, who's coaching, mm. uh, Hyun Chung now, who had a fantastic career mm. as well. That really made it easier for us. I think the guys now coming out of South Africa, for Lloyd Harris to do what he's doing is phenomenal. You know, mm. he doesn't have the luxury of having other guys around him. Wayne Ferreira, how can I, I leave out Wayne and Marcus Andruska? Um, mm. We had all those guys, and, you know, Wayne was having success early. I was beating him on the practice court occasionally. Yeah. Well, you know, if, if Wayne can be top 100, why can't I be? So we were yes. so lucky that we had those guys around us at, at a, a great coach. And John Newell, as I mentioned earlier, he really was a, a big mentor to me, certainly in my tennis playing days. Yes. So that was important. Then in my broadcasting days, I'll be forever grateful to, to the guy that I commentated with, Jason Goodall, yes. who kind of introduced me to the idea that maybe I should get into commentary. And we had a fantastic partnership for well over a decade. So without my chance meeting, um, you know, at the corner just by Southfield's tube station in London, who knows what I would be doing now. He was, yeah. uh, he was a tough critic early on. And in fact, it kind of shook me on occasions where, you know, he just put off the microphones and he'd say, listen, Robbie, you're being pretty average today. And it was like, no. I wasn't used to somebody said, you know, your energy is not there. Uh, you know, you're looking at your computer too much or you're looking at your phone and come on, let's get focused here now. And I'm so glad he did it because, mm -hmm. you know, it's quite easy in the broadcasting world to, to get sidetracked and not be fully focused on what's going on. And, and he always brought me back and he instilled the discipline in me in the, in the commentary booth that um, yeah. I think has held me in good stead. Yeah. But, um, one of the guys that I certainly looked up to as, as a broadcaster was John Barrett. 
and yeah. uh, John was the voice of Wimbledon when we were growing up. Certainly in the you know the early eighties, I used to listen to him all the time, and he was a fantastic mentor to me in the early days as well. Just again giving me some guidance and mm -hmm. helping me find my feet. So you know, I always enjoyed chatting with him and getting advice from him. So he is definitely mm -hmm. somebody that that uh, I would give a lot of gratitude and thanks to. And yes. um, yeah, as for the youngsters today, oh, in tennis, um, I think my biggest piece of advice, and I see it now with my own kid, is that I believe tennis is a team sport until the age of 18 or 19. You've got to be surrounded by other kids. Try and associate yes. yourself with other kids. Don't try and be an island. And it's very easy to be that way in our sport because it's an individual sport. Because Waylon beat me. Yeah. I didn't like the way he beat me. I thought he cheated me once. I don't want to practice with that guy anymore. I'm not going to phone him up and yeah. practice with him. Yeah. Where in fact, um, you know, you've got to put the emotions away and realize that you need guys to make you better. That's, that's yeah. the, one of the tough things about our sport. The, the better players that you can train with, the better it's going to be for you. It's not like golf where you're not playing against somebody else you're just playing against the course you can go out onto the range and hit as many balls as you want yes. whereas in tennis you need the ball to come back and, yeah. and and because it's a it's a sport with a lot of traveling and it can be lonely and you're on the road many weeks even as a junior try and yeah. surround yourself with a bunch of of guys that you can learn to get on with because yeah. you're going to need it man otherwise it's a, it's a very tough and lonely sport if you have a, a me against you mentality from a very young age, I think if you start mm. to progress in your career, mm. you need to develop a single mindedness. And I think the very best players do have that. But even, you know, looking at guys like Nadal, they can switch on their, their game face when they walk onto that court. Yet in the locker room, he'll, he'll be able to get on with everybody else. Mm. Roger's very <laughs> similar in that department, how they yeah. do it. I don't know, because I, I certainly couldn't do it. I was one of those guys who had a hangover for a couple of weeks, man. If I lost to... Yeah. I'm exactly the same. I don't talk to him, man. I don't want to see him. I would avoid him in the locker room. So I guess it's different strokes for different folks. But, um, yeah, I think... And be disciplined. Um, the one thing I always say is, is one of the questions I always ask youngsters, do you think it's more important to be disciplined or motivated? Yeah. And I'm always curious to hear what the answer is. And, Mm. And for me, it's it's hands down discipline. Mm -hmm. And there's a there's a lovely piece that I read on on the internet. It's um, the website is called Wisdom Nation, and the mm. title of the article is "Screw Motivation: What You Need Is Discipline." And mm. they explain exactly why discipline is more important than motivation because motivation is conditional on feeling. I feel good today. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go out. I'm going to have a good rugby session or a good tennis <laughs> session. Whereas yes. discipline circumvents emotion and feeling. And you do it anyway. And you get to, to feel good afterwards. And it's, it's a fantastic uh, little prose, little piece that you should read. It's about five, or ten, uh, five, five to ten paragraphs long. And you'll have a good laugh about it. There's a couple of <laughs> funny analogies that uh, the writer puts in there. It's something that always stuck with me and it's so true. Just be yes. disciplined. And it doesn't have to be a lot of stuff, even if it's, like you mentioned, um, odd we're doing 10 minutes extra after practice. Mm. When you're a youngster, teach your kid to do five or 10 minutes extra, one or two court sprints. You know, next year, mm. make it three or four court sprints. Build that discipline, mm. one of those good habits early on. And I think with discipline, you can do just about anything. I think, um, you know, you can, yeah. you can shoot little stars with good discipline, man. I think I think you definitely touched on something. I'm I'm a big um, believer or advocate for um, the 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 ruse that is motivation because I think motivation is obviously very fleeting. It gets you into action, but it it's it never sustains you for long enough. And I mean, I've I've been in locker rooms where I'm highly motivated and <laughs> you listen to music and you're ready to. Go kill the world, world and you yeah. still go and get a hiding against the Crusaders. And you, you wonder why you were motivated before the game, but <laughs> the, yeah, the actual you. result was totally different. Um, yeah. So I think what you touched on there is absolutely perfect uh, summation. 
and and obviously sage wisdom i, I believe so maybe a good way to to finish um uh, our interview or, or conversation it felt more like a conversation um i'd written down so many questions to ask you but but like like always it, it kind of veers off in its own direction which is, which is a great thing um so just from me personally i'd just like to thank you robbie for for uh, making the time to chat to me um your humility obviously shines through and the advice you gave in, in this um a very fleeting one hour i think uh, would uh, would get a lot of people interested and hopefully they'd learn something uh, and hopefully we can do this again in time because i'm i'm sure um we can only expand on this conversation we've had today yeah let's do it man wait and uh, <laughs> i i love chats like this um if it can help some of the youngsters out there or give people who are interested in tennis some some insights um mm. uh I love it. I love engaging with people. I love talking about sport, sport in general. I love learning from people like yourself and and getting mm -hmm. inputs. Um and the only reason I went to school was for the sport. I shouldn't yeah. say that, but uh well, hopefully Trevor doesn't watch this. So. Life, eh? Exactly. <laughs> I'm on the blower soon. But, uh, yeah, no, like you I'm, I'm really addicted to sport and uh, yes. and I'm fascinated by how other sports Go about their business, and then that's why if I can mention those two books again, the ones that I've yes. read of that Captain Class by Sam Walker, outstanding, about the greatest okay. sporting dynasties, and the other one was uh, Endure by Alex Hutchinson. If you if yes. you like sport and you're into sport, uh, read those two, man. They are fantastic reads. Awesome. Thanks again, uh, Robbie. I'm sure we'll chat again soon. Uh, take care, and obviously all the best for for sport and. Uh, hopefully like most sports we hope that they continue shortly um we obviously missing watching any sport on the telly yeah. for that matter uh but yeah thank you for your time and and god bless great catching up always a pleasure cheers take care bud bye